Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Thank you for coming out on a really cold January 3rd um, for this event, Genomics, Science, and Fiction. My name's Vivian Siegel. I'm the Director of Scientific Education and Public Communications here at the Broad Institute. Um, and like many things we do at the Broad, this event tonight is a bit of an experiment. The experiment is part of a larger initiative that we launched this year out of my office that we call Broad Creative, which stems from the conviction that crossing conventionally drawn disciplines between science and other disciplines, including the arts, can cultivate and inspire the creativity needed for innovative work. Um, what we've done tonight is bring together people with a variety of ex disciplinary expertise um, to bear on thinking about genomics and where our growing understanding of our own genomes and those of our neighbors could lead, where technological innovation might take us and maybe where it can't or shouldn't. These are issues that have potentially great biomedical benefit, but they're also rife with social, political, and ethical implications. And they're issues that have captured our imagination, at both as scientists, but also in the popular press, press and in fiction and in film. Um, you do have bios of all the panelists, three of the four panelists in front of you. We do have a substitution, but I'll briefly introduce them now. Um, Jay Clayton is the director of the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy at Vanderbilt University uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and also a professor of English at Vanderbilt. He's the author of a number of different books, including most recently Charles Dickens in Cyberspace. He's been very interested in literature and genetics policy and has led an NIH-funded interdisciplinary team that explored how literature and film shaped the public's understanding of genetics. Next to him, instead of Marnie Gilbert, Gelbart, we have Lauren Tomaselli, who's the Director of Curriculum and Training at the Personal Genetics Education Project. Lauren works to ensure that education about personal genetics is accessible to all students, with a particular focus on urban and rural communities. In addition to generating curricula, she works to train teachers about the ethical and social issues people will face as personal genetics becomes a more frequent part of our healthcare decisions. Next to her is George Church, who is professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, a senior associate member of the Broad Institute, and principal investigator, founder, and what he calls guinea pig number one of the Personal <laughs> Genome Project, um, research study that's based at Harvard Medical School. He's also director of personalgenomes.org, which is the world's only open access information on human genomic, environmental, and trait data. And uh, those of you who've Googled George Church know that you can find about just about anything about him on the internet. He's, so he's, he's our guinea pig for that, too. And to his right, finally, is Chad Nussbaum, who is the Broad's own scientific director of the Broad Technology Labs, which um, serves as a center of innovation to support the Broad community. He's had a long career at the Broad. Um, leading a wide range of technology development projects focused on new DNA sequencing methods and their biological applications. I've asked each of them to speak for five to ten minutes, after which they'll have some time to converse, and then we'll open up the floor to questions from you, and it's there where I really think this event might come to, you know, come to real life. Um, there's a microphone here to your right, and I'll ask that you c come down and ask your questions there. Um, we're also Twittering the event. There are some writers in the audience who will be doing tweets. If any of you feel like doing your own tweets, just use the hashtag BroadTalks. Afterwards, we'll have a reception so you can continue this conversation with the panelists and with each other. It's in the lobby, and we ha you may have seen the refreshments that are out there waiting for you. You may also have noticed a painted white beam in the lobby. That's one of the last beams that will be going into our new building next door at 75 Ames. Um, and so we invite you, if you would like, to sign the beam and become part of our permanent history as well. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, I'd like to um, leave, hand this over to Jay, who's our first speaker on this panel. Thank you, Vivian. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's, a, it's a lot colder, though, up here than it was in Nashville, where I was this morning. Uh, today, I want to talk about 
uh, two things, really. The first thing is the uh, way in which literature and film misrepresents science uh, persistently, and why that's a problem and what we can do about it. Uh, and the second thing I want to talk about is the importance of thinking seriously about literature, cinema, and cultural representations of genetics as, uh, as an endeavor that we should be engaged in in our universities and in our public discourse. Now, the, the misrepresentation of genetics is just, it's really staggering. Uh, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. But first, I wanted to give you a, a, a good example of the kind of horror story that cinema tells about genetics on a regular basis. Uh, this is the movie I Am Legend. By, uh, came out in 2007. Uh, I know that they showed it here at the Broad Institute. Uh, uh, how many of you all have seen this film? So we got a good number. So some of you all will recognize the opening clip I'm going to show you. It's essentially a zombie movie. Uh, <laughs> but the zombies are created by a geneticist. Um, and the, the, the clip is the opening sequence. And it's a news program interviewing Emma Thompson about her new breakthrough uh, curing cancer. And the clip is very, very quiet. So be prepared to listen hard. I think you can hear it. I've got the volume turned all the way up. But just be ready for, the, for it when it starts playing. It's not the given. Give it to me in a nutshell. Well, the premise is quite simple. Um, take something designed by nature and reprogram it to make it work for the body rather than against it. We're talking about virus. Indeed, yes, in this case, the reason um, virus, which you can engineer the genetic level to be helpful rather than harmful. And how many people are you doing this? Well, we've had 10,009 um, clinical trials of humans. And how many are cancer free? 10,009. So you have actually cured cancer. Yes, yes. <laughs> it didn't turn out so well. <laughs> it's kind of B roll film from any post apocalyptic view of New York. Uh, it, it, this is this is the end of the clip there. Um, the, the, genetics has been represented in several different genres in cinema. Uh, but the most common one of all is dystopian fiction. Uh, let me see. This is just a small sampling of the dystopian novels that have come out and, uh, that have at their heart a, some aspect of genetic engineering, cloning, uh, cures for cancer, et cetera. Some of these are remarkable works of fiction. Uh, Cloud Atlas is a really terrific novel, a less successful movie, but quite interesting nonetheless. Never Let Me Go. It's one of the most heartbreaking novels I've ever read. I've taught it now two or three times. And each time I read it, I find myself on the verge of tears at the end. Uh, I won't tell you what it's about, because finding out what it's about is part of the pleasure of reading it. But Margaret Atwood's two novels, Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood, are again dystopian novels that turn into post-apocalyptic novels as a result of genetic engineering. A super sad true love story is another dystopian novel, an award-winning novel, uh, a philosophical investigation. Terrific novels, also some schlock movies like 
um, The Sixth Day, which has stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as a uh, clone. Uh, so uh, the Robin Cook would be my nomination for the, the worst writer uh, on genetics and literature. Um, Boys from Brazil is a, is a terrific, uh, somewhat older movie, uh, again, about cloning. Uh, but you can see that dystopia as a genre is really the dominant mode today for the representation of genetics. This cinema is very interested in being able to explore the consequences of new changes in science for society, and really one of the best genres for conveying that kind of social message in both fiction and in literature is the dystopian genre. Uh, if, you, if we go back and think of the most important dystopian novel about genetics, it's really one of the most important novels about science ever written. And it was Brave New World. Uh, and it was written in 1932, uh, which was right at the beginning of what is widely known as the modern synthesis of evolution and genetics. And Aldous Huxley in Brave New World uh, captures much about emerging genetic knowledge of the 1930s. He, he knew about this firsthand from his good friend, Haldane, J.B.S. Haldane, and from his brother, Julian Huxley, two very prominent geneticists of the age. So the very, really the, the first major dystopian novel ever written, Brave New World, was written in conjunction with the, gen the modern synthesis and was a thoughtful response to that. Uh, then there, there, a second wave of responses, of liter literary responses to genetics occurs in the late 1940s and early 1950s in a wave of science fiction novels about uh, eugenics no doubt prompted by the revelation of the Nazi horrors from World War II. Uh, and then the third wave of significant writing about genetics was started in the 1980s and continues unabated today, clearly prompted by recombinant DNA in the late 70s and then the Human Genome Project today. So I'm going to end by just saying that the misrepresentations of genetics uh, is, is partly a result of the need for literature and film to provide a gripping plot uh, and a gripping plot for their narratives, but they, that the misrepresentations raise interesting ethical problems. So regardless of whether they get the science right or not, they become very teachable texts for an English professor or for a historian or for anyone involved in raising the public consciousness about issues surrounding science because a misrepresentation of an ethical issue is just as interesting to discuss with a class as an accurate representation of science. So I think that it's important for us as educators and humanists, those of us that are humanists, and if there are any in this audience, uh, to engage with these works, not to correct them and say, oh, they got the science wrong, but to say, this misrepresentation helps uh, raise the issue about the ethical uh, and social responsibilities of a doctor or a scientist engaged in discovery. 
I'll stop there and hand it over to Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that was a perfect lead into what we do. Um, I work at the personal, gen uh, personal Genetics Education Project, which is housed at Harvard Medical School. And what we do is we write curriculum and lesson plans um, for mostly for high school teachers and do teacher trainings um, to reach students, um, again, mostly high school students, but some middle school, some early college, to really sort of try to educate students and the young, you know, the generation for whom this will really impact the most. Like, they'll be able to know more about their DNA than probably most of us, um, at least starting at a younger age, and that they'll have more genetic information available to them when they're trying to make decisions for themselves about their health and their family's health. And so part of our goal is to not have um, the first time that they ha think about some of these ethical issues related to genetics be when they're in a doctor's office having to make a hard choice. Um, and so what we um, do is really, we use fiction a little bit, and we also really try to um, engage them through the ethical issues. Because especially for students who are not uh, particularly uh, in love with science, and I was a history teacher. I taught high school for six years in New York. Um, you know, it really is a way to reach students who often in a science class might think genetics is not about me or genetics is boring, I don't understand it. Um, and so what we try to do is engage them in issues that really relate to their lives. And so we'll ha we have lessons about um, athletics and genetics and the um, discovery of the so-called sports gene and the fact that they sell a test on the internet for $150 where teachers or where uh, parents can have their child tested to see if they supposedly would be best at um, you know, sprinting type of sports, fast twitch mm -hmm. muscle type uh, fibers or slow twitch endurance sports. Um, and so we really engage them on the ethics of that and they really understand right away why that matters to them. We find that talking to kids about parental conflict always works. They can all relate to that. So they auto, like they automatically understand that, yeah, what if my parents tested me when I was six years old and found out that I'm you know, supposed to be a great sprinter, then is that fair for them to have that expectation on me? They really relate to parental expectations, um, as you can probably imagine. And so the idea that uh, they might, their parents could have their genetic information at birth, um, which of course is probably coming, um, that they can know everything about their DNA at a young age is something that we want students to think about now and to be able to engage in a conversation like that with their parents also. Um, because, of course, if a child gets their DNA sequenced um, at birth, then that's their DNA. I know there are changes. Um, th but that's their DNA for their whole life, right? When they become an adult at 18, their DNA is still the same, pretty much. Um, and <laughs> George could get into that if he wanted to, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and so just for them to be able to engage in that kind of conversation. And um, questions, we also talk about um, embryo screening and um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And it raises some of these same issues that about what parents can choose about their child. Um, and it's very interesting. Some kids think it's totally fine for parents to be able to choose the eye color of their um, unborn child, you know, and then others, of course, are very opposed to that. Um, and so in terms of something like Gattaca, it's a great way, actually, even though it is a dystopian future where that is probably not very accurate, um, in terms of for people who haven't seen it, finding out at birth what jobs are, would be available to them based on their DNA. Um, you know, part of what we want to do is make sure that they understand that even though, you know, your genes might say a lot about you, that your DNA is not your destiny. And that, you know, to make sure that kids take away the message that um, even though the future in Gattaca, oftentimes what they remember is just that everybody's supposed to be perfect and the perfect people are the people who get to do you know, sort of whatever their life's goals are. Um, that really the message is that even if 
your DNA says something, um, says that you might not be good at something, you of course could still succeed in that. Um, and that's really helpful for students to hear. Um, you didn't mention My Sister's Keeper, which um, is a book and was turned into a movie that's about PGD, where it's based on a true story of Molly and Adam Nash, who were, um, Molly was a, I think this, she was born, she's about 16 or 17 now, and she was born with a blood disorder. And her parents, they were the first um, people in the United States to do um, embryo screening to find a perfect match so that she could have, um, I, I think it was HLA typing, I don't know if you know. Um, and they um, basically, so her brother was born to be sure that he was a perfect match to save her life. And so in the movie, uh, or in the book and the movie, this becomes a real burden on the child who's born to save the life. Um, and <clears throat> so the family didn't like the book uh, because it didn't really <laughs> represent, apparently didn't represent really what happened. But the kids, but students love it because it's just, it's an emotional story where they can really relate to the family dynamics, um, parents favoring one child over another, you know, the ex again, parental expectations. Um, so it's something that we then try to talk about, like Jay mentioned, even though this is represented wrong, um, even though, you know, this isn't what actually happened and this isn't what is necessarily possible, that it still engages them in that um, emotional way. And that, I mean, I find as a non-scientist that that is really helpful for getting kids in. And it helps us to also not just reach kids in science classes where some kids will walk in and sort of, you know, shut down because they are not good at science uh, and try to reach teachers in English classes and health classes and social studies classes so they can look at the ethical and the social um, and the legal issues surrounding it. Um, and we get great letters from kids where they, uh, they write us letters sometimes after we present. And they, um, I mean, it's really, you know, they say things like, I did not know about DNA until you taught it to the class. When I saw Gattaca, I was not sure that DNA sequencing was real or not. Although genome sequencing can benefit patients, many ethical issues will arise. Um, and then this, another kid thinks that um, all genomes should be confidential, like a social security number, so. Um, but you know, they really, very, very wise, yeah. <laughs> uh, which are so secure. Um, and so, you know, we hear from them where they say they went back and they talked to their parents. We get a lot of kids saying, I never would have considered going into science, but now I see how interesting this is. So, you know, that hook of the ethics and the fiction is really great. So uh, I guess my, my role or the la my role of my group uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> some of the companies I help start is to try to uh, learn what we can from the science fiction and bring it to science fact. Uh, <laughs> we try to develop technologies uh, that are pretty uh, bleeding edge and uh, generally aren't working at all. Uh, <laughs> But that's, that's kind of the, the price you pay. And I, and I want to say something in defense of the dystopic narrative. Uh, we, we like narratives as a species. We love narratives. Uh, and uh, Chad will tell us a story in just a moment. I'll, I, I won't ruin it. But uh, I think the dystopic narrative you know, has its origins in the, in the beginning of language when people would sit around the campfire and reenact uh, uh, hunts and describe all the ways that a hunt of a mammoth can go wrong. Uh, and so I like the dystopic narrative in that it helps us think about the technology that we're trying to develop at an ever breathtakingly faster rate um, and hope that we can preempt it going wrong, because it can go wrong. And so some of the things that we do, so in, the, in our group, we develop mostly technologies for reading and writing DNA, and hence from that we can read and write uh, biology, and in some cases we can read and write non-biological things uh, because of this uh, awesome power of, of DNA as an information molecule. We can increasingly uh, read and write data, um, nano uh, technologies, uh, atomically precise uh, machines, and so on. 
And as we do this, we, we notice that the technology is accelerating. How do you measure acceleration? So we can kind of measure it the way we measure computers. The, the price comes down by about one and a half fold every year in computers. And so you, you're constantly faced with a new set of uh, choices as a consumer. Uh, in, in our fields of, of reading and writing DNA, the prices come down by maybe a factor of 10 per year for many of the last uh, six years. And so you have an even braver new world uh, than we have already. The, the technology shock of, of electronics and computing now is even bigger, or, or would be bigger in genetics, um, if it had an impact at all, which it barely does. Uh, so we have this interesting uh, paradox that, that the cost has come down by may, maybe a million fold in the last uh, seven years. And it's not really affecting probably many people in this room, uh, unless you had a, a family history of a genetic disease. You probably haven't bothered to learn your genome. Maybe a, a raise of hands. How many people here know something about their genome by DNA analysis? Uh, see, so it's having very little impact, even on this uh, non-randomly selected crowd. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that that, that, that will change, change, could change overnight. Many technologies are in a very slow process for decades, like the internet, I consider a fairly slow process from its origins in the <coughs> 40s and 50s with, with, with very large computers and then networks. And then suddenly in 1993, it just took off. It had a, it had a spike, almost a singularity, where it went um, from zero websites in the world at the beginning of 1993 to millions, and including commercial uh, which was uh, websites, which was unprecedented. And I think there may be a similar year for genetics. So it, it has all the same components. The, the internet was in place, it just didn't have any good applications. And the World Wide Web was, and browsers were enabled that. Um, and I think the same thing could easily happen in genetics, where we're, we are already connected by the internet now, and we have a, a growing ability to analyze our own DNA and to act on it. And so, so not only can we, not only are we not, uh, genetics is not our destiny um, in the sense that we can manipulate our, our environment in various uh, fairly common ways, but we can manipulate our environment in ever more exotic ways. So we're getting to the point where we can change our uh, microbiome, and I'll leave that to Chad to talk about how you can change the microorganisms in your body. Um, but we can actually even change our own genetics. This is not science fiction. This would have been science fiction, but it's not anymore. You can actually take the, the, the blood cells out of your body, uh, hit them with a marvelous molecular machine uh, called a zinc finger nuclease, which will target one specific gene and get rid of both copies of it, both make both copies non-functional, and then put it back into your body. And you might say, well, why would I want to do that? Well, the reason is that some that people that have uh, HIV AIDS, maybe even multi-drug resistant HIV AIDS, um, can, can have the T cells, which is where the AIDS virus replicates, become resistant, no longer have the receptor for the AIDS virus. And you can take somebody who has full-blown AIDS, not preventatively, but actually curatively, and uh, by changing their T cell population, you can now make them genetically resistant to the virus. So this is an amazing thing. It's not at all what was anticipated in the science fiction. Um, it's, 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 it, you would think that science fiction writers or just fiction writers in general had, would have a huge advantage over scientists in that they don't have to work out all the details. <laughs> they just have to kind of think in broad strokes, but in fact, Science fiction and fiction in general is really about the human condition. It's how we relate to each other. And most of the fascination of the stories are the everyday things that haven't really changed that much. Um, and they're in the context of something that gives you interesting perspective and background, uh, you, know, you know, a warp drive or something, or flying cars. Uh, but really, it's the human condition that's important. And this change of genetics, which is a much more personal technology than warp drives or, or even handheld supercomputers, uh, this personal technology has got to have more interesting personal stories in it as we go forward. And it's all in the details. Uh, and so I'm reporting to you from the trenches. I actually do roll up my sleeves and put on gloves or type on my 
uh, programming languages. Um, and so we have a unique perspective that I hope you'll uh, take advantage of during the questioning period on the chat. So uh, we were standing around chatting before we sat down at the table, and Jay asked me, uh, so, so what do you do, since we never met? It's a perfectly reasonable question. And uh, I said, I worry about technology. He said, I do too. Um, <laughs> and I guess, briefly, the, the way to describe what I do is I'm, in some sense, coarsely on the next step in the chain uh, of users uh, down from George, where my job is to find the new technologies, bring them in, put them in the hands of scientists who want to use them, and make them run as, as well as possible. Occasionally, we invent stuff, but we're as more, uh, more of our effort is focused on making things that don't work very well work really well, uh, or uh, make them work for things that they hadn't worked on before. And the other question that Jay asked me was, so are you an engineer? Because that sounds like an engineer's job. And my answer was, well, I'm trained as a geneticist, but I suppose my job is to be an amateur engineer. And so the, what I've chosen to do with my time, since I'm the fourth speaker, I suppose it's incumbent on me to take the least amount of time uh, so that we can get onto the discussion, is to tell my own little science fiction story, starting from some things that I've been thinking about uh, in my work, both relating to the microbiome and uh, relating to some engineering approaches. Uh, and I haven't really developed the dystopian part of it, but I focus grouped it on George uh, just a few minutes ago, and he seemed to entertain by it. So um, let's try my vision, and then maybe when we're done, we can start to challenge the, the ethical issues that it, that it might raise. So uh, I think we're all aware that we have a genome that's about three billion bases in our bodies, and as George pointed out, it's gotten dramatically cheaper over the last decade in uh, generating that data, so it's now quite practical to take a person, look at their genome, make a lot of implications about their health. Uh, there's also a ton of data in that genome that we can't understand, but I like to wave my hands and say, the more genomes that come from people whose health we understand that we generate, we create a database whereby the next genome we get, we can compare that to the database and we get into this virtuous circle of data acquisition and knowledge acquisition. Now, that requires very, very large numbers of genomes, but we're, we're sort of on that growth curve. And, and, and George has been a bit of a prophet uh, about that topic. Now, the nice thing about the genome is that it's your blueprint. Uh, and when you're born, it contains virtually all of the information it's ever going to contain, with a few exceptions like in your immune system or if you have cancer, the genome doesn't change. Turns out there's a ton of genetic material in your body that isn't your genome, that's your microbiome. Uh, and in fact, I like to throw out statistics like there are 10 times as many microbial cells in your body as there are uh, human cells, uh, and that there are 100 times at least as many microbial genes in your body as human genes. Uh, and there, it's clear that these things are interacting in a very dynamic way with your environment, with yourself, with your human genome. So these fellow travelers presumably have a very significant impact on health. Now, what's so interesting about them for this little story I'm trying to develop is that the microbiome is a dynamic entity. That is, the population of your microbiome is very different between individuals. It's very different between different parts of your body. So your gut or your mouth or the back of your neck have very, very different microbial populations. Moreover, these populations change in response to changes in the environment. So if you move to Cambodia, uh, uh, my colleague Eric Alm over at MIT, uh, or was it Thailand, in any case, move to Southeast Asia, you show a very dramatic change in your gut microbiome. And when you come back here, it resets. So it's responding to the environment. And the microbiome, in fact, can respond uh, is established to respond in sort of two, or to act in sort of two ways dynamically. It can respond to changes in your body, but it can also, as we understand very well, it can change in a way that will cause illness in your body. So you get a new microbe in your body, or the ecosystem gets out of balance and some bug, for example, clostridium in your gut takes over, that can make you extremely ill. That's not a new, not always a new microbe coming in, it's just a change in the ecosystem. So it's very important to be able to maintain this ecosystem in balance. It's this nice uh, 
politically correct liberal sort of view of the body, but in fact it makes a lot of sense biologically to say that, it's, that your, your body consists of a series of ecosystems that when they get out of balance, it's not very good. So how do you maintain these things in balance? Um, I've already given you, uh, uh, alluded to one example where uh, under extended antibiotic treatment, you can wipe out most of the bugs in your colon. I said I wasn't going to tell the story, but it seems to be flowing naturally. You can wipe out most of the bugs in your colon. Uh, Clostridium will form spores that will survive perdurant antibiotic treatment uh, and can cause, can flare up in a place where now it's the only bug left or very few bugs are left. It can take over, cause very debilitating, long-term, hard to treat um, uh, a diarrheal disease. And in fact, it's been in the news uh, somewhat lately uh, at, that you can treat this simply by repopulating uh, the colonic microbiome uh, by fecal transplant. And this is a lovely story to tell at cocktail parties. <laughs> it, it never misses. Um, and in fact, it's not a new idea. This is something that's been done since the 50s. Uh, but uh, it shows that it addresses this issue of getting the ecosystem back into balance. So, why wait for the catastrophic case? Couldn't you monitor this ecosystem? So we're very good at monitoring ourselves. We take our temperature, we take our blood pressure, we take our heart rate, we, we go to the doctor every year, or if you're like me, every five years, you get a bunch of tests done, and that's a readout on what's the stasis of the system. Are things good? Are things out of balance? This is not a novel idea. Um, it's very common uh, in... Um, Industrial applications, oil pipelines need to know that the, pop, that the temperature and pressure of the oil in the pipeline uh, is within normal parameters, or you could have an explosion and a huge fire. Uh, and I used to give this talk called Principles of Automation, where I showed that. I had a beautiful example of an oil pipeline blowing up to make that point. Um, the, the, and this was about sort of automated systems, but in fact, biological systems obviously need to maintain this balance as well. Uh, what if you could monitor these things much more closely? So there's a known association that I don't really understand uh, between the microbial population of your mouth and tooth decay. Uh, it's easy to imagine whether it's causal or whether it's responding to the cause that the microbial population in your mouth changes when conditions create a proclivity to tooth decay or gum disease. Uh, and right now the readout is you go to the dentist and after five years he says, oh, you have a cavity, I'm going to drill that. What if you could monitor that population and say, ah, the conditions have arisen that in five years uh, you're going to have a higher chance of getting a cavity. Try this toothpaste, it'll change the pH or it'll put a different set of population of small molecules in your mouth. You probably don't need to do this with antibiotics. So now we're getting into a little bit into my science fiction story. Um, but imagine that your dentist is monitoring the microbial population or the conditions of the microbial population in your mouth uh, and then treating it to get the ecosystem back into balance, so reintroducing a missing animal or making the population, making the conditions of the population happier. Uh, it's not a big step from there to say, I go to the CVS and I buy a toothbrush that has a blue stripe on it and that blue stripe turns white when the toothbrush is used up and you throw it away. What if that blue stripe turned white when the population of your mouth was wrong. So now you've got this, and, and of course I'm eliding huge steps in the technology to actually make that readout turn blue, but take my word for it, we'll have that someday. Um, so now your toothbrush says, uh-oh, I better go to the dentist. And you can also imagine there's another step in there where the toothbrush turns a different color and that tells you which toothpaste to use. Uh, and that puts you down an interesting path uh, of ethics and marketing and uh, uh, direct marketing, I suppose. Your toothbrush turns blue. Uh, you immediately get an email from a toothpaste company <laughs> saying, aha, you need to buy this toothpaste. Or you get a, another email from a different toothpaste company because it's worth the toothbrush company has sold your email address to two different places. And they say, no, our product is better. Um, but that's only the first step. Uh, and, and as I said, um, in industrial applications, there's a tremendous amount of monitoring going on. So for example, a, a Boeing 787, it's flying 30,000 feet over the Atlantic, it's got hundreds of sensors all over its body, and it's in real time transmitting back uh, information on engine performance and fuel economy and the pressure of the cabin and wing flex and, and stuff like that. And Boeing knows from years 
of data collection, so analogous to collecting the data on thousands and thousands of microbiomes, they know that if a wing sensor sends back this many flex readings over a certain amount, we better go look at that wing. It might have cracks in it. And so they know test, if not test to failure, they know test to serious conditions. And so imagine if we can now take this principle and apply it to ourselves, not just take heart rate, not just take uh, blood pressure, uh, and not just have the fancy toothbrush, but we've now festooned our body with little sensors. And those of you who are diabetics are already familiar with a sensor that does something like this. Um, and these are now able to give a real-time readout. And maybe you have to go into the garage and get plugged in, and it downloads. And it says, OK, this, all of these parts of the body are in balance. This one's out of balance. You can then start to treat this. But um, you can start to treat your body. And we all treat our bodies as sort of managed uh, engineered systems, but this is a, just another few steps down the path of uh, engineering management of the system of your body. Um, the, each of these outcomes then creates a kind of uh, appropriate intervention um, that can happen by your doctor or it can happen by an email that you get and you can buy the appropriate product at the, at the Walmart or the CVS. And then so finally, we've reached the place where we've almost uh, cyborged ourselves with readouts. And these are all driven um, only from a health perspective. perspective. I'm not even postulating uh, any kind of uh, odd compounds that you'd want to put in your body or something like this. It's just, just monitoring uh, to keep in balance. Um, and then, of course, once you've collected all this data, and I've, I've already referred to the virtuous circle, um, what you can do, and some people will want to do this, is uh, um, you can put it on your Twitter feed or load it up to your uh, Facebook page, and that sort of completes the circle of turning yourself back into a piece of social media. Um, and so now, I think, is the position where we have to talk about the dystopian outcomes of this scenario. That's, that's the extent of my prepared comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for very interesting comments. Before we open it up to the floor, and I encourage you to come down to the microphone if you would like to ask a question, I wanted to give the panelists a chance to ask questions of each other. So if any of you want to raise any issues raised by any of the comments to date. So George, I've got, got a novel to recommend to you uh, about uh, changing the DNA of individual cells uh, with, uh, with nanotechnology. Uh, Greg Baer's early novel, Blood Music. So I oh, think I he, that. that science fiction writer, did may perhaps anticipate your work. Oh, yeah, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> you know, Jay, um, one of my, I love the dystopian science as bad guy novels, and I love the apocalypse <laughs> in literature. Um, or post-apocalypse. Um, but one of my favorite sort of, and I think the original scientific dystopian novel is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And it's sort of arguably, I saw someone shaking their head, so if there's something older, I want to hear about it. But um, it's sort of, obviously the technology wasn't there, but it's sort of a genetic engineering story. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've written three articles saying that, so I totally <laughs> agree. Uh, it's... Uh, it's not genetic technology, of course, but it is wholly biological. The, the film versions of Frankenstein change it into a cyborg and give you, you know, a bolt in his head and uh, electrical uh, equipment. But no, it's an entirely biological uh, creation of an artificial creature. And it is the first uh, the novel that I know of that deals seriously with uh, the creation of a human being by biological intervention. And it spawned centuries of pretty lively discussion. Yeah. Well, I, I would propose maybe the first science fiction is God creating man. Um, it starts right there, and we got a lot of problems. Um, 
But um, I, uh, Carl Worsey just passed away uh, not, not long ago, and I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the biome you referred to it. But I, I read his article, um, he wrote this wonderful article about 21st century biology, and he just blew my mind with the fact that, well, he, he's very angry at DNA and gene and molecular biology taking over and keeping away the wonders of all the other genes and whatever is going on between them. So uh, I guess a qu it seems to me there's a, uh, we're, we're almost kind of, the whole discussion almost assumes we know what, what the story is and we're writing science fiction about it. And it seems to me that he was saying we don't really know what the story is. So there is not, we can't even write science fiction about it. I just wanted to say that. Well, I knew Carl fairly well. Uh, and. Uh, greatly enjoyed my conversations with him, and and he was, uh, as as are many uh, of our contemporaries, interested in doing a survey of life on Earth, uh, and technology to some extent, the biotechnology we talk about is heavily dependent upon this survey of life on Earth. We are, uh, unlike many other engineering disciplines, where we we start with very simple tools and build them up into more and more complex ones. It, with biotechnology, we tend to look around the world for uh, complex technologies that already exist, that have been perfected over billions of years of evolution, uh, and we get to benefit from all that fine-tuning and almost perfectionism of, of biological systems. So Carl uh, was, was definitely a student and inspired many generations of students to think about uh, the unseen part of the environment, the unseen part of our census of, of different organisms. Uh, and he discovered a whole new uh, realm of life called archaeobacteria, but it was not limited to that. And, I, and we have uh, Stuart Brand and his colleagues are, uh, are undertaking as part of the Long Now vision, uh, really finishing the survey of all the living things on the planet. Um, and, and biotechnologists certainly will hopefully be stewards of that. Uh, and, and, and uh, help us keep the diversity that's so important for survival of those species and our own. Well, I'd just like to put in a quick plug for one of my favorite authors, Frank Herbert, who uh, wrote, of course, the Doom stories and many others which uh, talked about humans being very specialized over thousands of years, I think more of breathing than genetic engineering. And I just wonder if each of you panelists, if it's an appropriate question for this forum, might tell me whether you are likely to run out and get the new genetically engineered salmon for yourselves and your family if and when it becomes approved. <laughs> the new what? Salmon. salmon. It depends entirely on how it tastes. <laughs> and, and yes, I survived the Gom Jabbar. <laughs> oh, well, I am a vegetarian, um, although <laughs> my husband and daughter eat fish. Um, I mean, for me, I don't think it has, I'm so not an expertise on that, or an expert on that kind of thing, but I think I've sort of been more in the less modified foods um, category for a while. So I probably wouldn't, but I know that probably, I mean, half of what I'm eating is modified, and I don't even know it, so, you know. <laughs> so the, uh, the two novels that deal with GM food more powerfully and would put you, you off your dinner uh, are Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood. Uh, that said, uh, I'll eat just about anything. Uh, I am complete, I, you know, uh, humans have been intervening and in genetically modifying the environment for 3,000 years at least. Uh, all agriculture is involved in selection, and uh, GM food is a new technology for, for molding our environment. But it's, you know, I have no problem eating it, so yes. It does change in degree, though, the risk of stabbing myself in the back, um, in the sense that <laughs> Historically, you could only breed things that would breed, or you could only create, and I'm not sure this is, whether this is a matter of degree or whether it's really a, a, a dialectic junk, but uh, 
it doesn't seem to me a straight line to take a gene out of one organism and put it into another where you couldn't do it by breeding. Uh, it's, it's not the same thing. It may not be morally different, but it's not the same thing as saying taking a, a potato that's sensitive to a pathogen and breeding it with a nightshade until you get a nightshade that's edible uh, so that it's resistant to that pathogen. Um, rather than pulling a gene out of a third organism and popping it in there. So I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a lively enough topic to be worthy of discussion. Oh, yeah. So, so I, I, uh, California has uh, been <laughs> contemplating a law uh, for a while on marking their foods as whether they're modified or not. And, and I actually endorse this uh, concept of, of, of uh, labeling your foods better than they are. Uh, I don't think genetically modified foods is necessarily the most important label, but whatever it is that the consumer is concerned about, they should be able to get trivially. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you go into a, a restaurant and you happen to be vegan, it's really hard to tell whether you're eating, uh, you know, broth that was uh, from a chicken or a fish. Uh, maybe. And, uh, and it, but in addition, you know, there's things like... Uh, Many of the foods that we've um, modified by either modern methods or older methods uh, are less toxic than the natural ones. Uh, wouldn't it be great to know exactly what microorganisms are on the, the foods that have been in your refrigerator for a week? Uh, there are a lot of things that we should be monitoring in addition to GM. And, uh, and more importantly, just like medicine, where the one-size-fits-all model doesn't work anymore, it's true for foods, too. I mean, there are many people where the Atkin diet is, is lethal for them because uh, they can't handle the high, uh, the high ketosis. Uh, there's some where, uh, where bread is a really bad idea or fava beans or so forth. It, so we really should have personalized food. It sounds odd. <laughs> hmm. So I was wondering whether you, George, or anyone else could comment on chirality or right-handedness, left-handedness of DNA and molecules, which I've heard elsewhere, perhaps from scientists, science fiction, I'm not sure the source, uh, could really cause uh, 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 epidemics uh, that are not controllable by antibiotics or anything else we know. Um, and how much work is going on in that area? How true uh, are these rumors? Um, and uh, anything else you could enlighten us about? Right. So, so this is actually a fairly uh, difficult topic, depending on how you handle it. But the point that's being raised is that at a molecular level, uh, we have, uh, just like we have the difference between our right and left hand, we have right and left-handed molecules. And in principle, you could, you could take every molecule in my body and make a copy of me that is where every molecule has been switched mm -hmm. in its handedness. Mm -hmm. And this has been in science fiction for decades. Um, you know, somehow chemists and physicists figured, thought this would be an interesting analogy. And the properties of a mirror image you would be uh, look exactly like you, probably think exactly like you, would reach out the wrong hand, would apparently the wrong hand to shake, but it otherwise would be quite quite uh, un undistinguished. Uh, you would not be able to eat the food that's waiting for us out there uh, because almost every food element in there has a handedness and your body can't handle it. Your, your, your body would be almost completely uncorruptible if you were to die uh, or take a piece of uh, your body and put it out there, unlike most uh, biologicals, because almost every enzyme in the environment in our microbiome is aimed at a specific handedness. And so, uh, your DNA, your proteins, your RNA, your carbohydrates, your hair, everything would, would be indigestible to a, to a very close approximation. So there's been, like I said, our, 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 the business of my lab is to try to turn science fiction into fact, and so we are one of the few labs in the world that's trying to make mirror image life, and we do so uh, uh, as a safety feature, uh, but we, and with hopefully safety in mind, and we talk about it way in advance, so if anybody can think of something that we haven't thought of uh, as a safety. But it is potentially hazardous because mostly antibiotics do depend on chirality, and all the predators and parasites also do. So if you created an organism and let it loose, um, it could easily take over its ecosystem. 
would it interact negatively with our ecosystem and us? Could it? Could it? I mean, Could it? If, it's, if it's inedible and it's, uh, and it's destroying all the things that are edible, uh, yes, it could be quite a, quite a big okay. deal. Uh, well, I see it would also destroy everything that's, that's uh, of the alternate handedness. But if you, yes. made a, if you made a left handed flu, like let's say you want to study flu that is a little bit uh, dangerous. Um, if you made a left-handed flu, you could study it in a left-handed system and not right. have to worry about it infecting. Yeah. There, there are all kinds of positive aspects. You can make materials that would be more resistant to degradation. You could make drugs that would last in your body. There are many positive reasons. I mean, if there weren't, we wouldn't be studying it. But I like talking about the dysphobic parts <laughs> first. <laughs> Get the safety right first, and then we can worry about the, the, all the other things. Yeah. Thank you. You do need a conflict to tell a good story. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a pretty good transition. Speaking of destroying the environment, uh, I'd like to talk about bringing dinosaurs back to life. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jurassic Park is obviously one of my favorite uh, books and then movies. Are we anywhere close to having the technology and capability of bringing species back to life, preserving endangered species? I guess I should tackle that one, too. Uh, so so I, I have gone on record a number of times uh, on, on, on talking about technically how one would go about doing this. Uh, there, the, the, there are kind of two categories. There's uh, or, there are museum specimens that have intact DNA where you can sequence that DNA. So Jurassic Park uh, misrepresented the, the both our ability to get DNA from things that are more than a million years old. So we can go up to about a million years, but most of the dinosaurs are much, much older than that on the order of 80 to 200 million years. In any case, if you have a museum species that has DNA in it, so mammoths and uh, cave bears and, and so forth, those in principle, you, we now have the full DNA sequence or close, a fairly good representation of their genomic sequence in the computer. It is a non-trivial process. It's, it's become fairly easy to get it into the computer. Getting it back out of the computer and into a cell is hard, but, it, but, but that technology is changing quite radically. In fact, we just published a paper today that, that may make us re-examine how easy that is. But the point is that you would take, a, if, if to do that, you would take a living species that's as close as possible. So an elephant for a, for a, um, for a mammoth, uh, or some other bear for a cave bear, and you would manipulate the stem cells of that organism in the lab, putting in DNA in the precise location to change uh, it uh, as, as much as possible towards maybe taking key characteristics or eventually the whole genome and uh, make intermediate cells that were very similar, and then put that into a surrogate mother uh, animal uh, again as close as possible and then grow it up. So, so there is a big project now. Uh, it's moved from just science fiction to, to me speculating to a project called Revive and Restore where a bunch of ecologists, environmentalists, and molecular biologists are seriously prioritizing which species to bring back. And these in, some of the ones that have been discussed are the mammoths which have, have a, could have a very positive impact on the Siberian and other uh, tundra uh, uh, ecosystems, uh, the passenger pigeon, which we made extinct in about a 30-year period, uh, at dodo and other charismatic, uh, <laughs> iconic species. Just one last follow-up. Is this something that we could see in my lifetime, for example? I think you will see parts of ancient species brought back, meaning a few genes introduced to see how it goes. It's worth, it's worth noting that Older stuff than that, the DNA is completely uh, degraded. Degraded. Thank you. I knew there was a word for that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing to get back. So it's now 7 o'clock, so we have time for just a few more questions, but please make them brief, and then we'll end for the evening. Actually, I'm not sure how brief this is, but every once in a while, scientists get ahead of science fiction writers in terms of coming up with new ideas to explore, and I think George Church has recently done that with his book, Regenesis. And I was going to ask, uh, invite him to give us some, uh, some thoughts about what 
of what are, what are the philosophical, moral, legal, and social issues that he raises in this book are most in need of exploration by these other science fiction writer communities. Uh, I will just mention that the epilogue talks about the end of the beginning, transhumanism, and the panspermia error. So maybe I can invite him, George, to say something about that, and what are some of the issues that science fiction writers and philosophers and other, other people should be exploring to deal with some of the, the moral, legal, and other issues related to that. We're already arguing about whether myriad genetics really should be allowed to, to uh, patent individuals' genomes. Would you like to talk about some of the other issues that are going to come up with synthetic biology? Yeah, uh, so thanks for putting in a plug for the book. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to, I mean, I, I do want everybody to get a chance for their questions, uh, and that's a big topic. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the ones that we dealt with in the book was, was various aspects of commercialization, which has good and, and, and bad consequences uh, in our lifetime, not nearly of the, of the nature of wiping out the, all the people on the planet uh, in the process of curing cancer. But, you know, we have kind of day-to-day -day, uh, conflicts about intellectual property and, uh, and, and so forth. And I think we've touched on a few of them so far. But I think that should keep, maybe that's a good topic for after yeah. Next question. Okay, a couple of you guys have been talking about misrepresentation in uh, you know, fictional works. Uh, now, granted, there's some value still to be you know, gotten from the story, even though it's misrepresented, but what sort of steps do you guys see in terms of establishing a closer relationship between the scientific community and the, uh, the creative uh, fictional you know, community to uh, you know, create more, uh, more accurate stories? Um, I can mention one place that um, we're starting to work with a little bit, which is called Hollywood Health and Society, and they're based at University of Southern California, and so they work more with um, TV shows, um, and it's a lot of movies that are about science or medical issues have advisors, um, and what they do is, um, the woman who started it, her name is Sandra Buffington, and she, I think was a geneticist or a, um, a scientist, and she you know, just saw all the misrepresentations and started the center. And so they advise um, shows from uh, Desperate Housewives, Law and Order, ER back when it was on. Um, and they reach, you know, some of these shows reach 18 or 19 million viewers. And they had a storyline about, um, on Grey's Anatomy, about the BRCA uh, breast cancer uh, gene mutation. And so, you know, basically what they're doing is working to get accurate depictions of um, not just genetics, but of disease, basically, and health. Um, and then they do, I mean, what I have is basically an evaluation of their own research and showing, you know, and then they study to see if people are learning sort of what the actual mes message was, and they've been pretty successful. I would nominate Faust as an early kind of science, science fiction. Also, uh, next Tuesday, the Quantified Self show and tell is happening at Cambridge Innovation Center. So there's a whole other realm that's happening about this. But I enjoy dystopias as well. However, my issue mostly is energy and climate change. And what I find there is an inability a hole in the collective unconscious. We can't imagine surviving or thriving. There are no utopias that we can imagine anymore for climate change. And I think there's something happening in our culture about that. I don't know if we can imagine a utopia for genomics as well. So I'm wondering about that. What happens when we give up utopia? Well, I, I guess the, the point of dystopia is not necessarily giving up uh, on utopia, but to getting it right. Uh, I think for the climate change, one possibility that, that, that biotechnology is specifically addressing, whether it will be successful or not is not clear, is, uh, is making uh, is harnessing sunlight for fuel uh, and, and harnessing the carbon dioxide re 
uh, either uh, sequestering it into, into plastics and asphalt and so forth so that there's, it's, it's a net reduction of the carbon dioxide, uh, or at a minimum recycling it so you're less dependent upon coal and petroleum products. Uh, uh, and, so, and so the efficiency of uh, some of the biologically engineered uh, cyanobacteria is getting up on the order of 100 times that of corn, depending on how you do the comparison. So you could have it on a fairly small uh, uh, land uh, using uh, marginal land and marginal waters, brackish, or even ocean water, which solves some of the issues with water usage. Uh, no, Non-fertilized, because you're just releasing hydrocarbons. You're not actually messing with the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur the way you do with, with, with conventional agricultural species. So that's, that's uh, a utopia where we need to think of what could go wrong. Um, and I think the same thing goes for genomic medicine. I think there are many utopias that we could describe. but. I, one, one thing that, sorry, okay. <laughs> one thing that, that, at least in literature, utopias and dystopias have in common is that they're stable. And that couldn't be more different than the state of today's biomedical world, because as we talked about the paradigmatic cost of DNA sequencing dropping so fast, everything that we do is changing so fast. Mm -hmm. I think people, even from other technical areas come over and look at what we do, and they're terrified at the rate of, at which our base technologies turn over. And so, in a sense, as George was talking about, things are accelerating. They're not stabilizing. And maybe we've stabilized into a, a steady acceleration. Um, but I don't, it, it's hard for me to think about an end point. Rather, it's more than ever, it's a journey and a really rapid one. Chad is a profound literary critic. I think that's a really powerful insight in the, about utopia and dystopia is stable. Uh, a second thing to say about utopian literature is that it's not about the future. Utopian novels are about the present. They're, they're novels that intend to critique the present by offering an alternative, but they're, they're not about the future. And so uh, I think that the true utopians, uh, as George has just uh, demonstrated, today the true utopians are mostly scientists. Well, uh, we live in a country in which only like 30 percent or fewer uh, people believe in the evolution of humans without um, assistance from God. And th this percentage of, has, if anything, gone up during this time in which our understanding of the human genome has um, increased. And even per and perhaps even uh, the use of biotechnology might even reinforce the idea that, you know, it, of the need of an engineer. Do you, uh, so my question has, is, uh, are there ways in which uh, you see a confluence between um, our understanding of uh, genomics and uh, popular understanding of evolution may happen? I think the main way that people's minds gets changed is through practice, through practical application. And part of the reason that the evolution debate rages on is that people don't use evolution in their daily life. Now, that could change. Uh, you know, if, you, if, if more and more people work in a factory where they do radical evolution, maybe even more rapid evolution than, than uh, that are currently in textbooks, they may start to get the idea in the same sense that a flat Earth is a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. There's no reason to question it until you start uh, taking your ship around and around the globe and, and eventually um, taking your spaceship up high enough so you can see the globe. Uh, that, kind of real, that kind of practical reality that impacts their wallet uh, will be a, a big factor. Uh, you might say, well, that's kind of too late. Uh, we need to get from here to there. But at a minimum, that's, that's, that's where it starts changing. And, and many of these cultures that don't accept 
that say they don't accept evolution, they do accept microevolution, as they might call it, where, where the process of uh, development of drug-resistant res drug bacteria, for example, is an evolution that they will accept. Um, maybe even, uh, you know, uh, changing of, you know, one bird into another, as long as it's not a change of type. And that's progress. <laughs> maybe, maybe things will get clearer once people start wearing my microbiome sensor sets. <laughs> and you can go to my website and download the app today. Okay. Let's take a moment to thank our panelists and the audience for a really lively discussion.